YouTube. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video with Mr. Terry as I continue my search for historical knowledge found here on YouTube. All right, today's video is episode five of our six-part series by Extra History on the 1918 flu pandemic. And this episode is titled Leviathan. It looks like from the first uh, first frame here, um, going to be referencing a ship, USS uh, Leviathan. So um, this has been a very important series to to kind of go over, and I, I kind of picked around this time too because unmistakably people are making parallels um, to the COVID-19 pandemic and then the 1918 flu pandemic. Um, just by having a, a modern yeah pandemic, and it's been interesting to see kind of the reactions a hundred years ago to this pandemic and then what's going on today. And again, not that they're, they're apples to apples, right? Um, but interesting to see the reactions and all that stuff of, of what's going on there. And so this has been great. And I think it's been very timely and really important to, to study the 1918 flu pandemic, um, just as some context and a little bit of precedent for global pandemics in the modern age. So we're going to um, do this. So we got, this is episode five. So hopefully you've uh, seen one through four, those videos. If you haven't, go back in the playlist um, and you'll, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll see that. And it looks like we got about one more left after this. All right. If you like the original video down below is the uh, link to the original video. Uh, if you want to watch that in its entirety and it's important that you go click that, um, give them like view, subscribe, extra history is awesome and produce awesome stuff. So let's go ahead and get started with episode five. Splash. A body hits uh -oh. the water. Oh no. Days earlier, armed military police had herded troops onto the Leviathan, sealing them in watertight compartments. War. It was quarantine of a sort. Helmets on. If one trooper had the flu, it would only affect the bunkmates sealed in with him. It spread anyway. There is no more room in the sick bay, the mess hall, or any of the other makeshift hospitals. Can't imagine a place that could spread a disease more than a tightly packed battleship. <laughs> Um, that is the worst. So, yeah, I mean, if you're on a, on a ship, depending on where they're going, did, they, did I miss where they're, where they're going or where they're coming from? But it wouldn't take very long yeah, to, to do that. But that's amazing that even sealing them off didn't do anything. Patients lie on deck in the sun and wind, and bodies only have one place to go. At the rail, a chaplain mutters a prayer. Splash. Wow. Another man disappears into the The prayer event. was splash? Splash. In six weeks, the war will be over. Splash. Um, yeah, what else do you do? You gotta throw them over the side, right? Leviathan isn't the only plague ship. There are many like it. The New Zealand transports HMS Tahiti and Manchua deliver the silent visitor to Africa. Infected ships pass the flu to dock workers each time they stop to take on coal. From there, it rides the rail lines into the interior, then spreads to the countryside on bicycles, horseback, or by car. Each of the three waves of the virus, the mild first wave, the deadly second wave, and the less lethal third wave radiate across the globe. It storms every continent, sparing only Antarctica. Tracking the disease. Ooh. Thank you, penguins. They're good. Disease from the Surgeon General's office in Washington, D.C., Welch's friend and replacement, Victor Vaughn, expresses alarm at the flu's progress. If this epidemic continues at its mathematical rate of acceleration, he writes, civilization could easily disappear from the face of the earth within a matter of a few more weeks. It's pretty amazing um, to, to see. I wonder how long it took to get per, uh, um, death rate percentages. It would be hard to test, I guess, for people that have it, because I don't know if people got it versus didn't. But the... Um, Generally speaking, with with pandemics like this, their their rate is exponential. I mean, they get bigger as they uh, it, it multiplies faster as it as it goes on. And yeah, without either it running its course or doing incredible measures to stop it, it can contend uh, or it will you know contend continue. Sorry, on that um, exponential path, and we've seen that with uh, historically with diseases. He looks at his map, Kimberley, South Africa. When people speak about the flu, they'll always remember the sound of hooves and wagon wheels. It's the sound of the collection wagons, heavy with corpses. Mm -hmm. The people of Kimberley knew it was coming. Railway workers tracked its progress inland on the rail line. It advanced a thousand miles within a week. Kimberley is a diamond mining city, the largest in South Africa, and people here live and work in close quarters. 
migrant laborers sleep in crammed concrete bunkhouses famous That's for spreading sickness. People begin to fear each other. When someone sniffles in a shop, <laughs> people turn away, veins turning to ice. The distinctive scent of the flu is like... So it happens in stores and stuff now. Have you ever seen anything like that? It's like a chew, cough, and just... People are just like, I'm leaving the frame now. <laughs> Straw, they say. You can tell infected houses by the smell. Fear leads to dark places. Whites begin blaming their black neighbors for the disease. And within five years, their concern with hygiene will put forward a law that bans black South Africans from entering urban areas without a pass. Seen that in historic in, in um the history of, of uh pandemics, epidemics, illness is it amplifies existing hatreds. Right? Nations that you already don't like, it amplifies that. Right? Racially, culturally, you see that you see that happening. These these uh, 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 yeah, it amplifies pre-existing hatred. Immediately comes to mind is back in the um, in the 14th century with the the Black Death, um, how uh, how how negatively it was spun on like Jews in Europe, for example, and said it was a conspiracy or you know it has something to do with them or something like that. So you get these. Uh, yeah, again, I, I would just say it's amplification of existing, I don't know, hatreds or I don't whatever you want to call it, but amplifies it. It's another brick in the rising wall of apartheid. Across South Africa, the trauma... Part, apartheid, if you um, are talking about that, the South Africa was an extremely segregated place uh, by white settlers versus pre-existing Africans. And yeah, legalized segregation and didn't come to an end until um, the late uh, 20th century with the efforts of people like Nelson Mandela and stuff like that. So one of the, the last places out in the world that still had a uh, um, seg uh, legalized segregation. Bring several village prophets to the forefront, preaching religious and social revival while describing visions they've Horse. had while in the grip of Spanish flu. Some later ally with the African National Congress to fight for political rights. They will be jailed or locked in insane asylums. The flu, with no concern for politics, rages on. It's good that the mining city of Kimberley is full of excavation equipment, because they'll need it for the graves. Ah. 2,500 miners die in the autumn wave, a quarter of the city's working population. Quarter. By the time the epidemic is over, 9% of Kimberly's citizens are buried in the diamond-sheltering earth. The country, the worst hit in Africa, will lose half a million people. But another wow. colony will see at least 20 times more death. India. Traditionally, Indians cremate their dead on the riverbank and release their ashes into the Ganges. Right. But there's nothing left to burn. Dead bodies clog the wide river, gathering in clumps. Ganges is a highly polluted river too, for a lot of reasons. The dense population, um, and yeah, the it goes back to actually the ancient times of the, in a lot of the Hindu culture, this like purifying nature they believe of rivers. Like the Ganges is seen as like a like a sacred sort of river, so they've always been in proximity, and it's been a huge part of their culture. And you could see with this kind of thing, yeah, it, it looks like it, Earth here becomes like a floating graveyard in a way. Um, reminds me of the, the, the pandemic is, or the, um, the black death as well, back in like Avignon during the, um, uh, in France where the Pope was and he consecrated a river for the dead and they put all their dead in this river and he, you know, blessed it, consecrated it or whatever. And naturally it just washed up plague infected bodies around the whole, you know, the whole, the whole length of the river, which I'm sure amplified the spread of it a lot. India is no stranger to outbreaks. Just two decades before, the country had battled Black Plague. But the behavior of the British... Yeah, the, the, the Black Death is actually not gone. The one basically from the 1300s. I mean, the strain might be a little different. It actually pops up every once in a while. India is one of those places, actually, that it's, it's actually popped up. It's popped up in places in, like, the American Southwest as well. Um, so, yeah, it's not completely gone. Colonials during that time had made Indians wary of Western medicine. They'd herded people into health camps, burned personal possessions, and sprayed carbolic acid into homes. In other places, they did nothing at all. So even as flu whipped through the country, 
British officials offered little help and Indians accepted even less. Western medicine was largely reserved for the rich colonials or those in the cities. This is the era of British colonialism. Um, India did not exist as an independent nation until 1947, so it's still a part of the British Empire. Here. But there was an organization that tried to help, and often they were the only ones serving rural areas, the independence movement. In the Which rural villages, early, yeah. college-trained activists deliver medicine via bicycle or horse. Much of it is indigenous folk medicine that just manage symptoms, but given that every Western Institute, from Rockefeller to Pasteur in Paris to Koch in Germany, had failed to produce a cure, it was no worse treatment than the ill-received in the U.S. or Britain. Interesting side story, uh, uh, Gandhi was one of the people that served basically kind of as a someone I think that was delivering uh, medical equipment, I think for um, kind of the, the war effort, so kind of neat. The message was clear. Articles in the Indian press denounced colonial neglect, saying British authorities cared little for Indians, and in their hour of need, the only ones who stepped up were the revolutionaries. They had the grassroots support they'd struggled so long to secure. Like Gandhi. And so, Makes India sense. took another step closer to revolution, its independence movement gaining legitimacy even as one of its most predominant leaders, Mahatma Gandhi, was out of action. The virus nearly killed him. Oh, no. According to recent estimates, between 14 and 20 million Indians died from the flu. Oh. Died from the flu. 14 to 20 million. What, what immediately that brought into mind was the famine that happened during World War II that also killed millions. And this killed more. Um, ever, never really appreciated the death toll of the 1918 pandemic. I, I honestly did not know it was as high as 100 million people as, as they, it is on the high end. I, I never appreciated that very much. I don't know. The most from any single nation. Let's look at that real quick. So here's the deaths. Is this at by the end of it all? I mean, it's not even close. Look at India. Now, India is inc so incredibly densely populated, right? And you can see that under the care by the British, who are the governing body there, didn't really do much. So that's part of the you know, responsible. But then you look, though, I mean, 650,000 is the next one with America, which is a lot. Um, especially for a, a modernized uh, uh, um, industrial nation, right? That would be able to to produce medicine and stuff like that. But but you can see that the the numbers are high in in developed countries, right? You know, like France, Brazil, Britain, like uh, Canada. Those are those are big um, big countries. And yet the flu killed on, affecting each country in its own way. Japan called it sumo disease, since the first outbreak exploded after a public wrestling match. <laughs> there, the wearing of face masks became so ingrained that it remains a practice today. Yeah, it possibly yeah you'll see that in those cultures. Um, in Japanese, like you, they have incredibly crowded train systems, subway systems, and stuff like that. And it's, it's very common for people in those public gatherings, those densely populated ones um, there, and I think in China as well. Uh, the face mask, yeah, that's been around for a long time. Killed four million on the island of Java alone. It raged through what? Russia and possibly killed four million on the island of Java. It remains a practice today. It possibly killed four million on the island of Java alone. Wait, why don't they put that in the other list? Was that was the 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 the, the chart they showed? Not necessarily like those weren't the top ten or whatever. It's just they just picked a bunch. Um, Four million on, J on Java, which is, yeah, Indonesia. That's nuts. It raged through Russia and Mexico, both of which were in the flames of civil war. By 1919, Making it, even worse. it had penetrated the war-torn areas are where it got the most. Even the most isolated regions. The Wood River, Alaska. Coast Guardsmen step onto the riverbank, calling out to the Yupik village. No one answers. They're in one of the most remote places on Earth. Here... It's not unusual to meet people who still think Alaska is part of the Russian Empire, ruled by the Tsar. <laughs> now, there is no Russian Empire, much less a Tsar. And though news of the revolution hadn't made it, the flu had. They've heard reports of devastation at the inland villages. The disease strikes native populations especially hard. The guardsmen are here with a doctor to offer medical aid and assess the impact. But the village seems deserted. 
Their ensign hears something moving in one of the Earth houses and opens the door to investigate. He slams it and backs away, calling for a rifle. He then smashes in a window and fires into the house again and again and again. He only stops when everything inside no longer moves. Then they douse the village with kerosene and burn it to the ground. For the rest of his life, he will never forget what he saw. Three enormous sled dogs, starving and feral, fighting over the bones of a dead family. Oh. As the guardsmen discovered in Alaska, Spanish flu proved to be especially deadly to native people with isolated immune systems. It slew its way across the Pacific, hopping from island to island out of New Zealand. In Fiji, 5% of the population dead. Amazing how these more remote places got it. You'd think it would just be places on major, major connection routes, but it's all over the place. I mean, truly showing how more connected our world is than we actually think. In Tonga, 10%. In Vanuatu, it killed 90% of people in some villages, wiping out 20 unique languages. And then it reached Samoa. Pago Pago, American Samoa. Commander John Poyer, the naval governor of American Samoa, liked to follow radio reports on the wire. It gave him news from the war, from home. He could keep his finger on things. Suddenly, one item stuck out to him. Spanish flu in New Zealand. He'd been governor of American Samoa for about four years, and new Western diseases posed special danger to Pacific Islanders. And with New Zealand having taken neighboring Western Samoa from the Germans, there was probably ship traffic passing between Auckland and Western Samoa's port of Apia. Poyer radioed his sister territory. Why, yes, they said. There had been a ship from New Zealand. And yeah, there was some local uh, disease flaring up. too late. Why? Poyer sent an order to the docks. Close the port. No matter who comes, deny them the right to land. Dock them at the far end of the pier and move anyone ill to Navy quarantine vessels. Work with the villages to form shore patrols and catch those who try to sneak in. He radios a warning to his counterpart in Western Samoa and offers quarantine and hospital ships if needed. The governor of Western Samoa, offended by the aid offer, hangs up. One week later, a mail ship arrives from Western Samoa. A U.S. Navy vessel intercepts it. They can't land, the captain says, nor will Samoa or any American mail ship in its port accept outside letters. They must return to Apia. Furious, the governor of Western Samoa cuts radio contact entirely, freezing diplomatic relations. Huh. By then... It's ruining political uh, connections there, but it's like a lose-lose situation. I use that term, I feel like, a bunch of times in this, where every decision made is a lose-lose almost. People in Western Samoa are beginning to die sitting up in their homes. Fields go follow as entire families are unable to walk. There will be famine next year. A whole generation of village elders gets snuffed out. 22% of Western Samoa would die of Spanish flu, including a third of the male population. Wow. American Samoa continued its quarantine until 1920, until the last reports of Spanish flu subsided. It would be the only place on Earth that registered no flu deaths. The fever was beginning to break. So I wonder how they they were just they were just able to be totally self-sufficient because those islands, in large part, are uh, um, connected for their their trade purposes to get their goods. So. Just having to become um, sufficient there. I wonder what life was like in uh, uh, over there uh, because of that. But you can see they took it very, very seriously, closing it off. And it looks like closing it till probably one of the last people to lift their quarantines. So that's pretty amazing. Well, well neat. Um, I, I liked in this episode that we were able to see the evidence of the impact of the, um, of the, 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 the flu here in some of those other areas. Right, I had no idea it was as big as it was in India, and then um, those rates in uh, Polynesian islands um, are pretty amazing too. Because again, you'd think they would be so much more uh, disconnected. So you're seeing places that are not necessarily connected with the war, although I mean, indirect everything is. I mean, it's World War. It's it's war. It's a World War. It's World War One. So everything's like indirectly connected. But they also brought up that in places that were having revolutions or wars of their own, those those places, you know, got it. Like like Mexico with the Mexican Revolution. Um, 
and but yeah seeing um yeah a lot of interesting things here so there we'll see what they do with um with episode six probably maybe some final numbers um i'd like to see i think one thing that'd be really interesting to see is what was sort of the plan for changing some of the rules and laws and stuff that they had put in but um it looks like in a lot of areas not that maybe just they didn't talk about it you don't have nearly as much of the effort by governments to put in rules for things right quarantining rules social distancing rules and all that stuff and i wonder how that compares with like today what's happening um with a lot of rules right going in and is that just a you know to, you look at these these instances in the past and if if they had done more of these things in 1918 would these numbers have been you know vastly different you would you would think so in a way right um but anyway uh very very fascinating the series has been uh, so good there's so much here that i'm learning that i'm going to be able to convey to my classes going forward i already know i'm going to be talking about a lot more uh, just because in a history class, it's great to bring up this stuff. And that stuff's going to be fresh on people's minds starting next school year when we start meeting again. And definitely, um, I'm going to make it a point to to do compare and contrast. Once all this data comes comes back and is done with the kind of the current pandemic and then see what the responses were like and, and compare that, I think it's going to be a very, very valuable tool. And having this 1918 uh, flu pandemic to, to reference I think it's going to be great for education. So um, I'm excited and, and makes me excited to, you know, be a teacher and, and to be able to, to, to talk about this. Um, something that's very going to be very relevant for a long time. Definitely. All right. Awesome. Okay. Original video link down below. Go down. Click it. Okay. Give them a view, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Keep an eye out for the uh, final episode here, uh, which is number six. Looks like that one is called The Forgotten Plague, which is a good title because, I mean, be honest. Had you really heard much at all about the 1918 flu pandemic? I see it breezed over in, in my curriculums, but it's so much bigger than we think. It's it's so much it's so much bigger than we think. And I think again, like I said, it's going to be even more important now that we've had a uh, a generation that has experienced a pandemic, right? Because once you once you uh, a generation has gone away from an event, it tends to be forgotten in a way right and of course that's as is, is, is for history that's part of our purpose right is to make sure these events live on okay all right with that we'll go ahead and wrap up here uh thank you for liking the video thanks for subbing and uh thanks for supporting in all the different ways whether you're a member on discord linked down below for that patron channel member or just again simply a sub and uh hopefully appreciating these videos i really appreciate it on my end. So with that, we'll see you guys next time. Bye.